Hi, welcome to the second installment of Rereading Women of the Bible. It's my attempt to bring some sanity in this crazy, insane world that we're living in. It was a little bit insane before the coronavirus hit. There were a lot of things going on, elections, end of democracy, patriarchal things, women running for Knesset, women running in America, and um, there were a lot of things going on in this world, climate change, Greta Thunberg, and here we are with the world sort of closing down and a lot of feelings of like, there's like this end of the world kind of feeling. So I wanted to take a few steps backwards in myself. I find myself going inward also, like kids coming home, everybody sort of staying put and asking myself what's next, both for myself and for the world. And so I'm going back to my roots, going back to sources. And I find myself with a desire to reread the, reread my original, some, some things I used to read a lot. Um, biblical women. Hang on one second, okay? Right. So last night we read about uh, Hava, Eve, which we sort of talked about as being the foundation of the patriarchy. So much of what we see today that women experience comes from there, comes from what we read there. Formulations about women being here to serve the needs of men. Formulations of Adam Ishto, that life revolves around Adam and Ishto as being sort of the afterthought. The way women are punished for having desire. I, I feel like I relate a lot to uh, Chava's experience in the tree with a tree where she saw the, the tree and she liked it. She liked the, sa the, the, the colors and the smells. She wanted to touch it. She wanted to experience it because it had all of this beauty to it. And there's also a phrase in there that says, Nahmad hu laskil, that it also aroused her intellectual curiosity. It was arousing for her whole being. Uh, and for that, she was very severely punished for not knowing her place, not being obedient. It was all about not having that obedience. And that sense of like women constantly being punished for not knowing our place and not being what the patriarchy needs us to be or expects us to be, that's very real today also. And it's a lot of what I experienced when I did the crazy thing and said, hey, why don't we start a women's party? Can I say so um, last night also other people in the group were also talking about the ways in which the messages there in Grey Sheet about Chava still resonate today and how we're still unpacking them and how history is not a linear progression. History is up and down and up and down. And in some ways today, there are, in, in there are some ways that we're going backwards as women. So tonight we're gonna take a different, a different direction. I'm actually just sort of going in order of the Bible, of Tanakh. So the next women to sh the next woman to show up with some emphasis. There are like women here and there, like Noah's wife or whatever. But the next real interesting story to me is, is um, Hi. Hi, someone else just came on. Um, the the next. Hang on a second. Um, is um, we're going we're gonna to look now at, um, at we're going to look now at Sarah, the story of Saga, Sarah and Hagar. Okay, so um, we're going to start with. I'm using um, a text online. Um, I use the Chabad um, website because the Chabad website has a, a very lovely. Uh, English Hebrew translation side by side. So I'm going to put that here in the in the chat, so you can see what I'm looking at. For the, tonight we're going to start with Genesis, Reshit, uh, chapter chapter 16. Okay. So 
um, I'm just thinking if I should share my screen, would it be helpful to share the screen? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share the screen. Hang on one second. Um, gonna, here we go. Okay, so share screen means getting all my pop-ups. Okay, so the Sarai Asia Islam. Okay, the Sarai. We're, we're tonight we're talking about Sarah and Haga. Last night we talked about uh, Hava. We're sort of going in order. Hi, I don't know who just. Hi, came. hi, welcome. Okay, we're Thank looking. You. We're looking at um, Breshit, um, Breshit, uh, per, uh sixteen, chapter sixteen. I'm sharing a screen here from the Chabad website. I also shared the link. You can look at the link by yourself. It's just a very nice Hebrew English translation. Okay. The Sarai Eshet Avram Lo Yaldalo V'Lashiv Chamitzrit Ushma Hagar. Okay. So we know that this chapter is preceded by, you know, the story of Abraham coming to Avram, coming to Canaan and getting blessings and learning that he is the chosen one that he's going to have a great nation. But his wife, Avram, didn't have any children. Now, notice that it goes straight from there, there. We don't see any particular exchange between Avram and Sarah about this. We just see she didn't have children. Ah, but she had a shivcha. In other words, there's no kind of like moment of empathy for Sarai. There's no like, oh, what she might have experienced. Of course, we know already that the, the Torah is very sparse when it comes to emotional reactions. Uh, but still, this is still pretty, pretty stark, even by Torah terms, that we go straight from this woman could not have children. And also, there is no reflection here about what it meant for her. It's not the Loyalda. It's not that this poor woman is, is barren. It's she did not do this thing for her. She did not give him an heir. Oh, but she has a shivcha. She has a, an Egyptian, an Egyptian handmaid named Taga. Okay, so then we go from there too. But Thomas Sarai and Abraham, now finally we have some exchange. We don't see Sarai sort of talking to Abraham or saying, you know, hey Abraham, I'm hurting. We don't see any of that. Okay, but she, what she does say now, um, but Thomas Sarai Abraham Hinena at Sarai Hashem Eledet Bona Shifrati Ulai Ibane Mimena. She doesn't say to Abraham, you know, Hinena at Sarai Hashem Eledet. That's really painful. That's really hard. What she says is she she works it into his framework, right? The framework of oh well, you need an heir, you need a son to to have your blessing that's been promised to you. So she is saying to him, go sleep with my handmaid. Okay, so by, like, by our modern sensibilities, this sounds pretty wild, right? It's pretty wild, you know, that you say, oh, well, I'm not giving you a son, so why don't you go sleep with my handmaid? I mean, this is literally the handmaid's tale. <laughs> this is the story of the handmaid's tale. Straight here, this idea of that a woman's body is for the purpose of giving a, a man an heir. We don't have emotions about a, being a mother. We don't have desire about motherhood. We don't have any other experience about sex and sexuality. It's, oh, sex is for the purpose of me giving you the baby. And if I can't do that, then I have some kind of like surrogate. I don't know if any of you have like seen The Handmaid's Tale, but you have that, you know, that scene like from the very beginning where like, it's this, it's where the w one woman is like lying on top of the other and it's kilo, you know, like their bodies sort of become one. It's, it's pretty perverse, but it's right here. It's right here in Genesis chapter 16. What's even more is that we don't even finish the Pasuk when we hear Vaishma from the Kol Sarai. Okay, so they haven't even had any kind of emotional exchange. They haven't even had any conversation. They ha don't, haven't had any kind of like discussion about their relationship, about parenthood, about their own sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. It goes straight from Sarai saying, I don't have children, sleep with my handmaid, and Avram saying, sure, let's go. <laughs> like, it's just straight from one uh, to the other. And then we have the rest of the story. Okay, now, before we go on, 
uh, to talk about what happens next between Sarai Hanagar. Um, I want to compare this story with two other women in the Tanakh who also couldn't have children and also had conversations with their husbands about it. The first one that I want to talk about is Rivka, and the second one I talk about want to talk about is Penina. Okay, so Rivka is in um, Genesis Breshit, Perek um, 25, uh, Cafe, uh, Pasuk Yutet, chapter 25, verse 19. I'm going to share that screen here also, and we're going to switch switch screens for a second. We're going to go back to sharing the screen. Hang on a second. Um, where is my screen sharing? Oh, hang on a second. Bear with me. I don't know why I can't show the screen. Okay. Um, never mind. I'm having trouble sharing the screen. I don't know why. Okay. If you can, um, are you okay finding yourself uh, uh, chapter 25 verse 19? Cafe Yutet? Is that, do you, can you find that in the um, in the Chabad site? Yeah, I can. Let's see if I can. Maybe I can share the link. If I hold the link. Hang on. It turns me. Uh, oh, new share. Hang on a second. I got a new share. Here, I figured out how to share it. Here, I got it. Okay. So you should be you should be able to see the new screen. Okay. So let's talk about Yitzchak and Rivka. This is Isaac, the same sort of thing we're talking about, heirs and uh, genealogy. Okay, who comes next? Um, so Yitzchak was 40 years old and he took Rivka as a wife. Okay, and she, by the way, has um, a lineage, which is actually unusual for women in, in the Tanakh in general. Where we we're told here we've come back to army, but then I'm a hot up on her army, Lolly Ishta. She has she has lineage, she has an identity. Okay, so that's already a step up from like the standard way that women are introduced in the Tanah. Vaya Ateri Tchakla Hashem, the Noah is Joki Akarahi. Now look, here we have a totally different reaction from our Abraham. Where where, where it wasn't Abraham, it was Abraham. Avram didn't notice that Sarah was having an experience, that she was like barren. She, he had to sort of be told by her. And he didn't even like have any particular empathy or emotional reaction to her. He just sort of like, when she said, okay, why don't you sleep with my handmaid? And he just went and did it without any conversation. Here, Yitzchak doesn't have to be told by Rivka that she's hurting. He figures it out by himself. By himself. And look, look what he does. He goes straight to God. He pleads with God on Rivka's behalf, Ki Akarahi. And it's not because she can't give him a child, it's Ki Akarahi because she's in pain. In other words, he, he Yitzchak here, has empathy for his wife on a few levels. First of all, that he recognizes that she's Akara and that that is a pain in and of itself, not just because, you know, can, I can't give you a child, but also that he goes and he speaks to God on her behalf because he's got the relationship with God. He's the one who has the power. He knows he has that power. He knows that he has the position to be able to offer her a voice and a representation. And he does that. And God answers. That's it. He does, he does it, he does it, he does it fast and it's done. So this is a very different reaction. In other words, if we're comparing, if we're comparing the way Avram related to Sarai's barrenness versus Yitzchak, what we're seeing is just one generation apart. So this isn't an issue of generation or culture. They're both from the same culture, the same time period, only one has empathy for his wife, one sees his wife as a whole person who experiences pain, and one absolutely does not. Avram could have been like Yitzchak. If they were only a generation apart, he could have, but he didn't. So I want, I want to suggest that this, is a, this text is a, a criticism of Avram. It's a criticism of him that he didn't 
he did not see and recognize Sarai in what she was doing. He didn't recognize her, he didn't see her. And even within patriarchal structures, that is painful. That is painful, that is painful. Okay, let's go back to, um, oh, and before we do that, I wanna also look at one more story. The story of um, Penina and Elkanah, another barren women, woman. It's in the first chapter of Samuel 1. It's Shmuel Aleph, Perak Aleph. Okay, well, we have another man who finds out that his wife is barren. And he, he, how does he relate to it? Uh, let me um, share that with you also. Hang on a second. Um, let me go. Uh, share, new share. Here we go. Okay, share. Okay, hopefully you're seeing that. So here we have a new screen. Shmuel Aleph, Perak Aleph. Right. Okay. Here we have the classic, the male lineage. We had there was a man from a time. He has his whole lineage. He has a presence. He has an identity. The whole history. Okay. And now the lost Nashim, Shema Khatana, Shema Shini Pina, Mili Pina Yatinu Hana Any Ladin. We have he has two wives. Both of them get names. Hana and Pina, that's already something not all women in the Tanakh get names. And one of them has children. Okay, Penina has children, Bachana had no children. Okay, and now, we don't yet have the interaction between them. We don't yet know what their relationship is here. Even though there are echoes here of the Leah and Rachel story, okay, which is also another story you can look up. We're gonna look, there are, there are, there are a bunch of barren stories, but I'm choosing just three today. Okay. So he goes and he's going up. We have the story where he goes up and he's giving a misbeah. He hasn't, we're not sure if he's noticed his wife or not. It's sort of just given as a fact. He's got two children. One, he's got two wives. He's got two, two wives. One has children. One does not. We don't yet know what the emotional experiences are. Okay. Now. So here we have a very interesting conceptualization, which also takes place in different places in the Tanakh, where one wife is for the children to give heirs, and the other one is for love. So here it's very clear that Elchanah has divided his two wives into these two roles. One is the mother and one is the lover. Basically, Penina is the one who's giving him all the children, but Hana is the one who he just loves. Okay, he sort of accepts it. But is, is he also loving her extra because she is uh, Akara? It could be that part of the reason he loved her was out of a certain type of sympathy because it says, Ki Hashem Sagar there is possibly a certain kind of empathy there, like he's giving her extra love because he recognizes that maybe what she really wanted was children. Okay, so that's definitely a possible reading of, of verse five. Okay, and now we hear it, see it again in, in, in verse six. And her rival would frequently anger her. Okay, so she was often... Um, she was often angry, all right? We, th th now, this is, this is new, okay? This is new for us to really get into the heart of a woman, okay? Because both in Sarah and Rivka, we don't really know what they felt or what they were experiencing, but here we have kas. And not only do we have kas, not only do we have anger, but it's almost okay. It's like, it's legitimizing her anger. It's legitimizing her pain in that she didn't have kids. Okay. And she would, she would cry and she wouldn't eat. So here we have also very, um, very understandable reactions. To, when we feel pain, we're angry, we cry, and sometimes we use food. Either we don't eat or we eat more. In other words, we use food to punish ourselves or punish those around us. It's a, we have a, an eating disorder here, you know, as a response to pain and anger. Okay, now, look at verse 8. In verse 8, Pasukhet, 
Here's what we have Elkanah's reaction. What does the husband say? Vayomer la Elkanah isha. Hana, lama tifki? Lama lo tochli? Lama yera levavech? Halo anochi tov lach me'asara banim. Okay? Aren't I better for you than 10 sons? What do you think about this reaction? What do you Amazing, think? Amazing, actually. Yeah, how's that? Because of the fact that it is prioritizing the emotional relationship within marriage, that the marriage is there for the two partners to keep each other company rather than simply to proliferate and bear children. So the marital relationship takes primacy. I like that sentence. That is lovely. That is absolutely a lovely reading. That's a lovely reading. Um, do you think that would satisfy her? No, I don't think it would satisfy her because of the society into which she was born and um, the concern to see um, her relationship with her husband live on in a child of their own. Yeah. Well, it's possible that also not just because of society, maybe she actually really did want children. Like what if, is it possible for her to both want children for herself, for not, not, not just because society wanted, and for her to be feeling a pain of not having children um, at the same time that she loves her well, husband? Well, it's, it's, well, wasn't it assumed, and I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that the people back then assumed it as well, <clears throat> that in women there, women there is an innate desire for marriage and children, which is why the woman does not receive a commandment to marry, but only the man does. Mm, yeah, maybe. That's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. I would also like to suggest that she possibly did, you know, ha want a relationship with her husband, like you suggest. But at the same time, look at look at pasuk yud, right? Ten. Even after he says that, even after he says that to her, she says it says vehi marat nefesh v'tipalel al Hashem v'bachot ipker. She's still crying. In other words, he's saying to her, "Aren't I good enough for you? Aren't I good enough for you?" And she still continues to cry. I think what we so have, clearly. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I think that I, I, I really like your reading. In other words, that he's trying to say, we have a relationship that stands on its own. But she's asking him for something else. In other words, she's, she's in other words, as opposed to like, I'd like to contrast this, for example, with Yitzchak. Because Yitzchak, when, when he realized that Rivka couldn't have children, he didn't say to her like, come on, what's the big deal? Like, you know, aren't I good enough? He said, I'm going to go ask God for children for you. In other words, that was like a, a deeper kind of empathy. In other words, he was saying, I am going to try to get you what you want, exactly the way you want it. As opposed to Elkanah who's trying to say, oh, I know you want children, but uh, maybe you want something else instead. In other words, it's sort of like a digression. It's sort of like sometimes, you know, when you're upset about something, like, you know, I don't know, you, you get a bad haircut or something and you're crying about your bad haircut and then somebody says like, what's the big deal, dude? You want your hair this way anyway? And you're like, no, 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 no. I'm really sad because I wanted it the other way. In other words, maybe, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. But what I find so interesting in El Hana's uh, re response to his, his wife's situation is that he wants to feel validated and valorized in, in her eyes. And we don't see that with the other two. Right. And, and actually what I'm, what I'm finding so interesting about these three different uh, excerpts that you presented is um, they present wildly different uh, responses to right. the same situation. I mean, one of the things you didn't mention that I wanted to ask, but I didn't know if I was allowed to interrupt or not interrupt. was when Sarah was Sarah I was talking about giving um, her handmaid 
um, to Avram, she sees the handmaid as an extension of herself, as her own yeah. property. Like, yeah. um, if you're talking about Avram not having empathy with his wife, there's what about um, Sarai's relationship with Hagar even back then, right. you know? I really want to talk about that. Let's go back to that. I really want to explore that right now. Let's go back. Let's go back to the um, to that uh, that story. I want to talk about Sarah and Hagar. Let me just make sure that. Do you see the screen? Do you see the the um, Genesis screen? Did that change? Did that switch back? Hang on a second. I'm just. Yes, I do. Okay, great. So it's not it's not clear to me if like. So what yes, I. Says it not so. Okay, so we were up to the part in the story where. Um, where she said, uh, Avram, she said, take, take Hagar as, as, you know, you, you know, as a mother, you know, have sex with her instead of me as my sort of like surrogate and have a baby. And then it says, Avram, he just did it. Okay. But then Pasuk verse three. Okay. So, 10 years have passed, you know, since they've been in this sort of raw uh, relationship. And now she just gives him, she gives, sorry, she gives, Sarai gives Hagar to Avram. So, so what does that mean here? In other words, Sarai on a certain level is participating in the patriarchy. In other words, Sarai, she's participating. She's, she's now no longer just a victim of the patriarch. She's a participant. She's giving away another woman to be used as a sex object. So she's doing that. So that's a really, really uh, important shift. And it's important for us to notice that because it is, it is very possible for women to participate in patriarchal structures. You know, we need to like acknowledge that and we need to recognize that women are also enablers and women can hurt other women when, especially when they're acting on behalf of, you know, men like, oh, it's all, it all revolves around Avram's needs. Avram's needs for a property, you know, Avram's need for a vehicle, for an incubator, for his heir. And so she is helping him with that role and not paying much attention to, as much as exactly what you said, as much as she, Sarai, was an object, Hagar is even more of an object. So, Okay, now, so we have that, and we don't hear Hagar's voice at all, anywhere. Hagar's voice does not exist. Okay, so let's keep going. And now, what happens? So, she gets pregnant, and then we have this really strange formulation. What we have here is... Uh, the hierarchy, we're seeing here an insight into hierarchies among women, okay? Because what we had in the previous verse was that Sarai was using Hagar, so Sarai was the one in power using Hagar who had zero power, and now in Dalit, the hierarchy among women is shifting, and Sarai, who was supposed to be the Gveret, she was supposed to be the matriarch, has now been lightened, and like, oh, what does that mean? Like, what are the implications of that? So now, again, now important here, we don't know if when it says Vatakel Greta if that is Hagar's reading of the situation or if that's Sarai's reading of the situation. Which one of them is writing into our history the idea that Sarai just lost power? Because we don't have Hagar saying anything, but we do have in the next verse Sarai talking about it. It's Sarai, it is Sarai who is perceiving herself as being lessened, which of course goes to the whole idea that the person who has real, the woman who has real power is the woman who, who gives the progeny. The woman knows, if you go back to, let's say, the Elkanah story, maybe in, with Hanan Penina, even though Elkanah loved Hanan more, According to this formulation, Penina is the one who had power because she has the babies. Okay, so here too, here too, there is the perception that the woman who can give the man the progeny is the one who has the real power. That's what Sarah is saying. And so she's feeling lessened. She's feeling that in her hierarchy among women, she has been lessened. 
And now, but what does she do? The first thing she does is she gets angry at Avram, as if this is Avram's fault, which raises a question. Is it? Is it Avram's fault or is it Sarai's fault? Who's the one who altered this relationship? Who is the one who has, who has decided that Sarai has lost her power? It's not clear that this is Avram's fault. It could be that it's Sarai's fault. It could be that the whole thing is in Sarai's head. But Sarai is coming to Avram and saying, God will judge you. God is angry at you, all of that. But we don't know that for sure. And, and, and I have, yeah, go ahead. Did you want to say something? I have a question, like, uh, were any privileges given to pregnant women at the time? Like, did they receive better food or were some of their duties a little bit lightened when possible? Can it be that uh, Sarai sees uh, Hagar getting preferential treatment in some aspects of her life mm -hmm. and becomes jealous and, res and resentful as a result? Oh. Or like she was relieved of some of her duties, like, you know, oh, Hagar was supposed yeah. to be, you know, she was supposed to be a handmaid and she was supposed to be responsible for washing Sarai's feet and suddenly she's not washing Sarai's feet anymore. Or she was supposed to help with the cooking and somehow she's not helping with the cooking anymore and now it all falls on Sarai, like that. Like, is that part of what was going on? Yeah, I think that's an excellent, yeah. point. That's an excellent point. Really excellent point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now what's interesting though is that we don't, we don't hear that. In other words, we don't hear Sarai saying to Avram, I need more help. I lost my help. Could you get me more help? She doesn't say that. Instead, it's all this like passive aggressive stuff, which is a lot, yeah. which, which is a lot of what we see in real life today with women. You know, women a lot and I think, of, yeah. I think what I also love here is um, there are things that we cognitively understand and recommend. But then emotionally, we can't cope with the very situation we suggested. So it's this gap between feeling and between rationality. Yes, because what, what do we believe here? I mean, w looking at this rationally as women, we can, we can read this and we can say, Sarai was hurting. She was hurting. She was hurt because A, she couldn't have kids. B, she made the suggestion to her husband to take her handmaid. And what she really wanted was for her husband to say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I love you. You're my wife. It doesn't matter that you can't have kids. I love you anyway. That is what she wanted. That is what she needed. Instead, she got this, you know, our mom says, oh, sure, I will have sex with your handmaid, and I will have sex with her, but I'll also have a baby with her, and he'll be the king. You know, he'll be the prince or whatever. And now she has, like, no outlet for expressing all that. Or maybe she does have an outlet and she chooses not to. What does she do instead? She yells at Avram, says, you know, God will judge you. And now she's about to go torture Hagar. She's about to torture Hagar. She takes it all out of Hagar. Instead of, instead of saying, I am hurt. I am angry and I am hurt. Right? That's what we're seeing here. And that's very real. I mean, women do that today also. We take things out on each other instead of saying, I am angry and I am hurt. Right? Yeah. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so what happened now? Uh, Sarah goes to Avram, and again, instead of saying, I am angry, I am hurt, please help me, please treat me with respect, I've lost respect, I need respect. What she wants to say to Avram is, respect me. But instead of saying, respect me, she says, you know, I've lost respect from Hagar. So how does he respond? How does he respond? What does he say? Hinei shifchatech biyadech asila hatov be'enaich. Do whatever you want with her. I don't care about her. They're poor Hagar. Can you imagine? Poor Hagar. And of course, what happens next? But to Aneha Sarai. Sarai tortures her. The first thing Sarai does is she tortures her. Avram does not care about Sarai. He does not care about Hagar. He cares about Hagar even less. And as a result of both women not being cared about at all, Sarai now has free reign to torture Hagar. And that's what happens. This, this, what we're seeing here is two women living in a patriarchal structure with, with no power. The one who has a little bit more power exerts the power over the other in a cruel way, in cruel ways. This is, this is when women do, do, don't challenge the hierarchy and instead go to the 
passive aggressive place and take it out on each other. And this also is very real today. This this happens today. This happens it with with you know in real life with women who you know like. For instance, you know, when we when we ran uh, recently, you know, I, I started a women's political party. And so I learned a lot about this issue of what women do to each other. And one of the things that we heard, we heard from one woman who is, has a high position in, a, in her city council that she purposely does not bring women in into her, into her city council because there is not there is not room for more than one woman. And she's afraid that if she brings in more women, she her position will be threatened. I mean, this is real. This is real. This is 2020. This is women feeling threatened by the presence of other women in a place where there are limited power resources for women. We're seeing we're seeing the reflection of exactly that right here. In other words, when women are faced with a structure with a system in which we have limited power, there are things women will do to each other in order to retain their own power. That's what Sarah did to Hagar. That's what this um, uh, deputy mayor did in her town. And, and this is real, you know, so. And there's also, because we're dealing with a, a tribal society, there's also the hierarchy of women mm -hmm. in polygamous marriages. So the older wife does in fact have a say over the younger wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and and he's and it's interesting to see um, that Avram doesn't want to make a decision because what happens within the household dynamics is uh, Sarai's responsibility. Yeah. 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 The issue of hierarchy among women is very important because a lot of times we don't think about hierarchies among women in patriarchy. We just think, you know, men and women, but even within this structure, there's hierarchies among women. Very, very important here. Okay, let's read, let's read on a little bit more. Okay, so Sarai tortured Hagar, and of course, Hagar ran away. Of course she did. So the Malach comes in. So you, you have Avram messing up, and you have Sarai messing up. And nobody here is doing the right thing. So you need a malach to come in and save Hagar. Um, so she's saying, the malach says, who are you? What's going on? And she says, I'm running away from Sarai, my mistress. Just you go and continue to suffer. Okay, the malach is saying, Go back to where you're suffering. Go back to be abused, which is also cruel. Why is the Malach asking her to continue to live in this situation of cruelty? It's very, very hard to, to sort of wrap my head around this about the idea that God's messenger is telling Hagar to continue to be tortured, like to sacrifice herself for the purpose of whatever, you know, whatever her son is going to be, Yishmael, whatever, whatever kind of like you know, long-term destiny is going to come out of her womb. In order to get to that place, she has to be willing to sacrifice her day-to-day -day, uh, ability to live normally without being tortured. But, okay. It won't be for, it, it won't be for nothing. You'll be blessed. Everything will be okay in the long term. Just sacrifice yourself now in the long term. Everything will, everything will be okay. So at least, at least the Malach is trying to give her some kind of um, comfort in what she is, what she's experiencing. And he acknowledges that she's being tortured. So I guess that in itself is something. That he heard that you're being tortured. We recognize, we acknowledge so like with a hot sale, like at least uh, she has that, and you know he continues to bless her that that she's going to have uh, you know a, a son that he's going to be you know great nations and all that. And then just skipping down to fifteen. Okay, so all of this is the story behind the creation of Ishmael, which is sort of like a side story in the entire. Like all of Sefer Breshit is supposed to be about 
the lineage of Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. So, so all of this is like this side story about the creation of Ishmael, which wasn't really meant to be the point. The point was supposed to be about Yitzchak, but it was all of this emotional mismanagement, the complete emotional mismanagement and uh, the sort of real dysfunctional relationships here. Um, as a result, not just a patriarchy, it wasn't just a patriarchy because we've seen with Rivka and with, with Pina that even within the patriarchy, it is possible to have empathy and humanity. But here we have a particular story in which there was patriarchy and then there was abuse. It was patriarchy and Avram abusing Sarai and Sarai abusing Hagar and also Avram abusing Hagar. So we have all of that abuse and it's not it's not enough to just say well this was patriarchy because it doesn't have to be that way even within patriarchy it's possible to have empathy Yitzchak had empathy for Rivka it's, but the Torah also tells us that Yitzchak loved Rivka like there was love there you know so it doesn't we don't it doesn't have to be that patriarchy equals abuse but in this case it was compounded the abuse the abuse came about because of women not being awake enough, because of Sarai not being awake enough and not being empowered enough to say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what, this is what I want. This is what I need. Um, like, as uh, you know, yeah. What do you think? I'm thinking of um, something totally different, but you'll see the link in a minute. My actual area of, of specialization is German literature. And there's a sentence by Peter Handke uh -huh. where he's talking about the death of his mother. And he says she had never learned to say I. Oh. And we're, we're dealing here with a, a situation where the concept of self, the autonomy of self, is, is not presumed. And we're seeing right. it play out with the women. Right. That's an excellent point. Because in all three stories, none of the women actually ever says, this is me, this is what I want, this is what I feel. None of them actually says that. And actually, it goes back to, we did last night, we were talking about uh, Chava and Eve, Eve, sorry, Chava slash Eve, um, and about how she ate from the tree, you know, she desired the tree, and how she was, you know, it talks about how she loved the taste and the smell, and she, she had curiosity and she had desire, right? And so one of the points that I was making last night was that she got punished for that, but that this is what, this is what I want for, for women today. I want women to be validated in our desire, in our, you know, that we, that we should have the right and the ability to say, I want, or I love, or I need. Right, so it's possible that Chava had that and she was punished for that. And what we're seeing as a result of all of that are all of these different women who are unable to say, I want, or I need, or I desire, or I love, or please give me this. This is what I want from you. Like that, exactly what you said. Yes? Yeah. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Where are you from? Me? Yeah. I'm from, originally I'm from Montreal, but I've been living almost 30 years in Windsor, Ontario. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's in the middle of the day for you. Yes, it is. It's uh, 10 to 3 in the afternoon. Right. Okay. We're, on, we're on daylight savings time, so there's only six hours difference right now. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for um, sharing the conversation. And um, thank you for providing the resources and the yeah. excitement. And <laughs> my pleasure. Stimulation because I live on my own, and because I'm a senior, oh. I'm locked into my house and I'm going batshit crazy. So, this was great. <laughs> Wow. Good luck with the virus. Good luck with the isolation. And uh, um, we'll do this again. Maybe uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's Friday, so it's a little hard. Sunday, we'll do it again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.